Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Paranat Kid, and I welcome you to Reversing with Dynamic Data Resolver. If you are not already in the Discord chat, please go to blueteamvillage.org, click on the Discord channel link, and I would like you to give a warm welcome to Mr. Holger, and let's start with the, with, with the talk. Hi, and welcome to my presentation, Reversing with Dynamic Data Resolver Best Practices. My name is Holger Unterwing, I'm a security researcher at Cisco Talos, and I'm mainly focused on malware research, threat hunting, and tool development. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at hunterbr72. I'm the author of DDR, and uh, I will guide you through uh, the different features of DDR today, the installation process, and uh, I will show you some of the best practices, how to use the tool, and uh, some of the special cases and uh, caveats, uh, which you can uh, see later on in the demos, where you might can uh, run into. So, what is Dynamic Data Resolver? Uh, first of all, Dynamic Data Resolver is an instrumentation tool. It is uh, instrumenting the uh, binary so that you can uh, trace all the instructions uh, the binary is executing and uh, it is collecting all kinds of data from strings to uh, register values, uh, memory locations, etc. etc. It comes with an IDA plugin which is uh, controlling the backend so uh, you can easily um, handle everything from this IDA plugin and uh, you don't need to uh, use the command line tools. You can and um, I will uh, talk about that later on. DDR comes with a client server architecture so um, you have um, the uh, DDR server uh, which is uh, running on the uh, malware PC side so the PC where you are executing malware and uh, you have the IDA plugin which is uh, running inside of IDA on the Analyst PC. It is highly recommended uh, to separate these uh, two machines. In theory you can run all of that uh, on one machine but uh, keep in mind that uh, you are executing the malware at the end. So the malware really uh, runs on that machine and uh, you might not want to infect uh, your machine uh, where you have uh, your IDA installation on uh, it'll be infected with um, uh, with malware. So, um, what can I do with uh, DDR? DDR um, was mainly built to resolve dynamic values, and um, this is why uh, I've called it uh, Dynamic Data Resolver. But it comes with all kinds of other features. But for now, let's keep with the uh, data resolving option you have in uh, DDR. Uh, you have the option to resolve uh, certain register values, for example. So if you want to know the absolute value of uh, EDI or uh, EBA, uh, EBX or uh, EAX, uh, you can just do that with one click. Um, you can also uh, get the pointer to the memory um, this value is pointing to, or even the pointer pointer. And uh, DDR also tries to detect um, if uh, the address which is uh, stored in a certain, um, in a certain register uh, if that one uh, points to a certain API call like uh, virtual protect. Uh, and uh, if that is the case, uh, it will also resolve the uh, API call so you can see the, uh, the human readable name of uh, the function call. After you have uh, run a trace and uh, DDR has um, all the uh, instruction traced, uh, you can highlight uh, the instructions uh, with a color. Uh, you can just uh, highlight them uh, depending on how many times they were executed. So, uh, you get a, you, so you get a pretty quick overview about which basic blocks were executed by the program uh, and how often these basic blocks were executed by the program. As you can see here on the slide, if you are if you see a, a color uh, which is uh, a more warm, uh, a more warmer color like a red or purple, uh, you know that uh, this basic block or these instructions were uh, executed many times. So uh, it is likely that it is maybe a de decoding routine or something like that. So that already gives you a good clue about uh, what the sample is doing uh, and what parts of the sample are executed and what other parts are maybe not executed. 
You can also get a table of uh, all the uh, API calls the sample has um, executed. So um, you can search through this list. You can search for certain uh, API calls like uh, virtual alloc or something like that. And uh, then you can do a double click on the line and uh, you're jumping to the uh, disassembly code where this API call uh, was uh, called. The same applies for strings. As I mentioned earlier, DDR tries to collect all the strings at runtime and um, it is filling this table with these strings and uh, the table is again searchable so uh, you can look for certain interesting strings like uh, PE for example uh, if you're looking for a PE header um, and uh, then double click on this line and uh, check out in the disassembly uh, what's going on where this, uh, where this was uh, used. And we will see all of that later on in uh, the live demo. Another neat feature of uh, DDR is that uh, there is a smart way to dump buffers at runtime. So um, all you have to uh, hand over, to, all you have to uh, hand over to uh, DDR is uh, the size of the buffer, the address of the buffer, and uh, when or where uh, you want to dump the buffer. Uh, and uh, we will also see that later on. Uh, for uh, for example, you just have to mark the operands in the disassembly which are storing these informations. Uh, the size, the address, and uh, at the end where you want to dump the buffer. Unfortunately, often uh, malware comes with uh, anti-analyzing features and um, it is not executed like it would be executed uh, on a normal PC if you're running it in a VMware, for example. Uh, so uh, DDR comes with an option to patch uh, the sample at runtime. So for example, uh, you can knock out certain instructions or you can toggle the E-flag and manipulate uh, the, uh, the execution flow. Uh, so um, if there is a conditional branch, uh, you can just uh, toggle the E-flag and uh, the conditional branch will do the exact opposite. But again, we will see that later uh, on also in the demo. And last but not least, um, you also have the option uh, to completely skip certain functions. Uh, you can just mark a function, skip it and uh, return a faked uh, return value. So if you have, uh, for example, an, a certain function in your malware sample which is uh, checking uh, for um, virtual machines or for um, anti-debugging stuff, uh, you can just skip the function and uh, return the value which is telling the sample um, that it is not uh, getting debugged or that it is not running on a virtual machine. Uh, but again, we will see that later on uh, in the demo. If uh, IDA and uh, DDR is not enough for you to analyze the sample, um, you can also create an uh, x64 debug script, which is uh, automatically um, executing the sample. So it uh, automatically loads the sample into, into uh, x64 debug and uh, it is automatically breaking at uh, that address which you have uh, highlighted in IDA uh, when you have uh, uh, picked this uh, menu point. If you don't like x64 debug, uh, you also have the option to uh, create an, um, a, a new executable of the binary with an endless loop at uh, the marked address. Uh, so you can mark a certain uh, location or a certain address in a um, site uh, of either, uh, pick this menu option and uh, then a new binary is generated which has an endless loop patched uh, at that location. Uh, so you can start the binary, uh, it starts to loop uh, endlessly and uh, you can attach uh, your favorite debugger to it, restore the bytes and uh, proceed debugging it. Okay, um, that should be enough for a quick overview about uh, what you can do with uh, DDR. Uh, in the upcoming demo we will see all these uh, features uh, in details again. So let's start with uh, the installation. Um, of course, first of all, you have to download DDR. You can get it from uh, its uh, repository on GitHub. And uh, once you have downloaded it, um, it comes with an, an installation script. And uh, pretty much all you have to do is to uh, execute this installation script and uh, it will guide you through the uh, installation process. Um, again, uh, we will see that later on in the next demo.
If you want to stay up to date uh, with uh, the latest versions of uh, DDR, you can follow me on Twitter. And uh, every time I'm changing, uh, fixing, or uh, uh, fixing anything or releasing uh, new stuff for DDR, um, I will announce that uh, on my Twitter account. If this presentation um, is um, uh, not uh, enough for uh, the information uh, you are looking for, you can also find an, a very detailed blog post about DDR, which I've released uh, end of May on our blog, which is also describing the different, uh, the different uh, steps, uh, the different features and uh, the best practices uh, and uh, the caveats uh, which you have to be aware of when you are working with DDR. DDR has a uh, client-server architecture. Uh, keep in mind that um, DDR uh, is uh, instrumenting the binary. So the binary is getting uh, executed uh, uh, at the end. So uh, it is uh, highly recommended uh, to split the analyzing part and uh, the execution part so that you have an analyst uh, PC where your IDA is running on, including the plugin, and a an, uh, dedicated malware PC where you are uh, executing the malware sample and analyzing the malware sample. The DDR server is uh, controlling um, the backend of um, DDR, which is uh, implemented in um, or implemented uh, using the Dynamorio framework, and uh, that one is at the end uh, executing the sample, instrumenting the sample, and uh, collecting all the data, which is then transferred back uh, to the uh, IDA plugin. Uh -huh. But uh, we will also see that uh, later on in a demo. Okay, so um, enough theory. Uh, let's uh, have a look how that uh, looks in the real world. Installing DDR is pretty straightforward. All you have to do is uh, to execute the DDR installer.py script and um, it is uh, solving all the dependencies for you. Um, after it has downloaded all the dependencies, uh, it will ask you a couple of questions uh, about uh, the IDA installation directory, the IP address uh, it is supposed to listen on, etc., etc. And um, after you have done that, uh, you can start a local HTTP server, or uh, in other words, uh, the script is starting an HTTP server for you, and then uh, you can move over to the IDA machine and um, access this uh, HTTP server and download the uh, DDR IDA plugin side uh, of the installation. Then you unzip the file and copy over the content to the traditional IDA plugin directory. That will change in the next release, which is uh, coming out very soon, and uh, we will move over to the uh, IDA user plugin directory. So that has the advantage that you will not uh, need any administrative rights anymore. Once you have done that, uh, you need to figure out which uh, Python version your IDA installation is using, and uh, then you need to install two dependencies for um, this uh, Python version, uh, the uh, requests uh, library and the PE file library. And with this, uh, you are ready to go, and uh, you can move over to the server side again uh, and uh, start the DDR server. Okay, so after we've seen uh, how the installation works, uh, I can give you now a quick uh, walkthrough of uh, the different uh, DDR features which uh, I've mentioned earlier. Okay, for this, uh, and uh, we have a dedicated analyst PC where IDA is running on, including the plugin, and uh, we have a dedicated uh, machine where we are executing the uh, malware on and where DDR server is running on. Uh, so let's move to this malware machine. Once on the uh, malware machine side, we are starting the DDR server via the DDR server Python script. And um, when we are starting it, uh, there's a little hind that uh, you have to be aware of uh, that there is a caveat with uh, Windows and uh, or Windows command prompt and uh, Python scripts. If you're marking any text uh, in the output window, uh, you are freezing the Python application. So um, that means that um, if uh, the plugin would try to talk to the server now, uh, you would run into a timeout.
And if that happens, you time out. And if that happens, you uh, just uh, need to hit escape a couple of times or uh, just do a control Z and restart the server if you like. Okay, so let's move over to Ida. The first thing uh, you usually want to do is uh, you want to run a trace. A trace is filling all the internal data structures uh, inside of DDR, which are necessary for most of the other features. And uh, you have two options, either uh, to run a light trace or a full trace. A full trace uh, is a trace which is collecting as much uh, information as possible per instruction. Uh, so for example, is it, is, it is saving all the register values uh, for every single instruction. A light trace uh, is uh, only collecting, collecting a subset of uh, these informations, but uh, enough information uh, that you can uh, have a look at uh, the API calls, for example, or at uh, the strings uh, which were traced, uh, or to get a source operand. And uh, a light trace is usually uh, something which I'm running when uh, I start to analyze the uh, the sample and if I just want to get an overview if I just want to highlight the traced instructions for example or if I just want to see the API calls then uh, the light trace is good enough uh, later on when I'm analyzing a um, crypto algorithm for example and I need uh, more information um, <coughs> Uh, for example, all the registers, uh, then I'm running a full trace, but uh, I'm only running a full trace for um, a small uh, address range or for a few basic blocks, for example, uh, because uh, this is really time consuming and uh, it's also consuming a lot of memory. So uh, you usually want to limit um, the amount of uh, instructions which you are uh, instrumenting with a full trace. Okay, enough about uh, traces. Let's uh, run the light trace and uh, check how that looks like on the DDR server side. So the sample is executed and uh, the dialog box which you have just seen just belongs uh, to the sample code. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with DDR. Don't be confused by that. Once uh, the analysis is done, you can see that uh, the trace log file is uh, written to uh, the same directory where the original sample uh, is uh, located. And uh, you can also see that uh, the temporary trace files were deleted uh, based on a server command and then transferred over to the IDA plugin. So now we can switch back to IDA and uh, we also see this method can switch back to IDA and uh, we also see this message inside of IDA that uh, the light trace uh, was done successfully. So this uh, means that uh, DDR now has all the information it needs and uh, we can execute other features like highlighted traced instruction uh, which uh, is giving us an overview about uh, which basic blocks were executed uh, or which instructions were executed. Okay, so let's move to the next feature. Uh, you can knob out instructions at runtime. So um, if you have uh, certain instructions which you want to get rid of, like the dialog box uh, which we have seen earlier, you can just mark these instructions and uh, you go to the patch menu in DDR and then um, the next time you uh, execute the sample, so for example you run a new trace, then um, these instructions are knocked out, they're not getting executed anymore and you can see here that um, it is responding much faster because uh, we didn't have the uh, pop-up of the dialog box and uh, the sample immediately proceeded uh, with execution. Okay, the next feature which I would like uh, to show you is um, how you can use the dynamic values which were collected by the trace. Now first we are doing a trace again, uh, this time we are just doing a trace over a couple of instructions. Uh, you are picking full trace for marked address range and uh, once this is done uh, we have all the values uh, from these instructions inside of the database. Uh, so we can just go to get value for source operand and uh, 
we are getting uh, the value for Rax in this case. Uh, or uh, we can just uh, get the values uh, from memory pointers, uh, like you can see here, or uh, all kinds of other information uh, DDR has collected. Next nice feature is uh, that you can uh, collect all the strings and API calls at runtime. Uh, you can show both of them uh, via tables, via the, via the DDR menu. So um, if we are looking at the strings, for example, uh, this is a list of all the strings uh, which we have collected at runtime. And of course, uh, you can also search for something in there, yeah, like PE, for example. And if you're double clicking, on the line, then uh, you're jumping to the line in the assembly um, where it is used. You can also have a look at the uh, API calls which were executed at runtime. And uh, again, the same applies like for strings. You can uh, search for something and double click on it. And uh, then you see where it is uh, used inside of uh, the code. You have seen earlier that uh, you can manipulate the code flow by knocking out instructions. But uh, there are also other options inside of DDR which are manipulating the code flow. The next one which I would like to talk about is uh, the option to toggle the eFlex. So for example, if we have a code like this, uh, where we have a conditional jump and a comparison before, then uh, we can toggle the eFlex at uh, the jump. In this case, uh, you have to note that uh, EAX can never be bigger than 5. So, uh, at least in theory, uh, this jump should always be taken in this code. And uh, the uh, program should print out main A is not greater than 5. If we want to uh, manipulate that, we can just mark the GLA instruction, do a right click and uh, go to the patch menu inside of DDR. Inside of the patch menu, we pick a toggle E-flag. In this case, uh, we have to toggle the SF flag. And uh, once this is done, we can now uh, just uh, run the sample if we want. Uh, so for example, again, over the patch menu, uh, if, we pick, uh, if we pick that one, then uh, <coughs> uh, the sample is just getting executed. But uh, we could also um, use any other uh, feature of DDR, uh, running a trace or uh, doing a dump, which we will see later on. Um, all these uh, patches which I have applied will uh, work for all the DDR features. Once we executed it, then uh, we can move over to the DDR side and uh, check the output of uh, the file. Oh, sorry, of the executable. So uh, here you can see that uh, the patch worked and um, the program printed out uh, A is greater 5 and this should never happen. The last option you have is uh, you can skip functions at runtime. So uh, for example, if we have uh, my function 1 here in this case, uh, maybe something which is doing some uh, anti-analyzing, anti-debugging stuff, uh, you can just skip it and you can fake the return value. Uh, you're just marking the first instruction in the function and uh, you're going again to the patch menu, uh, skip function at marked address at runtime and uh, you hand over the faked return value and that's it. Now you can execute the sample again and uh, if we are moving over to the DDR server side, we see that uh, the sample is getting executed. And uh, in the output of the sample, we should see that uh, the my function one output is gone because the my function one is not executed anymore. Another main function of DDR is that you can dump buffers at runtime.
and you can do that in a smart way. Later on, uh, the string will be copied into this buffer, which we are going to dump. Uh, so remember that for later. So for example, if you have a uh, function like virtual alloc, um, all you have to do is uh, you have to mark the operand, which is uh, storing the size of the buffer. Uh, get buffer size. And um, the next thing is uh, you mark the operand, which is uh, storing the address of the buffer, which you are going to dump. I'll get buffer address. And uh, last but not least, um, uh, the final step is uh, you mark the instruction uh, or the location where you want to dump the buffer. So I use marked address to dump buffer to file. And that's it. Uh, <clears throat> now you can go to the dump menu and execute the sample and uh, the buffer gets automatically dumped at runtime. Once it is dumped, um, it is transferred over to IDA and uh, you can store it somewhere on disk. Uh, and here you can see that uh, it is the buffer which I've mentioned earlier where uh, the program has copied the PE string into. If you want to debug the uh, sample inside of x64 debug, you can also uh, generate x64 debug scripts, which are automatically setting a breakpoint at uh, the location which you have. So once you've generated the script, you can uh, load it into uh, x64 debug. Uh, all you have to do is uh, to run the script, it will automatically start the sample and uh, break at uh, the breakpoint which you have highlighted in IDA. So here we have reached the breakpoint, the script uh, has finished and now you can proceed debugging in uh, x64 debug. The last feature which I would like to show you is how to create endless loops in binaries. So um, if you want to create an endless loop, loop you can just uh, mark the line where you want to create the loop and uh, then uh, you select create execu executable with loop at marked address. Now DDR is creating a executable with loop at marked address. Now DDR is creating a patched binary and uh, you can move over to the DDR server site and uh, you will find a patched binary in a site of the samples directory. So um, now you can start this uh, binary. Uh, just double click on it and uh, uh, at a certain point uh, we are reaching this endless loop. So now we can attach our debugger to it and uh, proceed debugging the sample. So after um, pausing the sample, uh, of course, the first thing you have to do is you have to replace uh, the patched bytes, uh, the patched bytes of the endless. This little help in the uh, DDR server output uh, to see what kind of uh, bytes you have to patch. Now you're just uh, copying the address into this command and then finally uh, you have uh, the original commands back uh, inside of the binary. So when, you, when we are proceeding to debug you see that uh, this changed to the original bytes and now you can just uh, proceed debugging uh, like usual. And that's it. Okay, so this was uh, the installation and uh, the feature walkthrough of DDR. Let's uh, move on and uh, have a look at uh, some of the special cases and of course uh, the best practices. Um, the better you know DDR, the more efficient you can use DDR. And um, as usual, uh, the easiest is uh, to watch a quick uh, live demo about it.
When uh, I start analyzing samples, uh, I like to run a quick uh, light trace. A light trace uh, is uh, only uh, executing 20,000 instructions by default. Now you can change this default value. Uh, if you're running a light trace, uh, you can probably set that up to 200,000. But um, this is in this case for uh, this sample not necessary, so we can leave the default value. Once the uh, light trace is executed, we can highlight the traced instructions to see which uh, basic blocks were actually executed. This was pretty uh, quick in this case, uh, so let's see what's going on. Highlight traced instructions, and we see that uh, there are only four basic blocks which were actually executed. Uh, so it seems to be that there is uh, some anti-analyzing uh, checks going on. So let's go into the last function uh, which might be responsible for this check. So when we are scrolling down a little bit we see that uh, it seems to be that this function is uh, dynamically uh, resolving the get native system info API call. Uh, it's using get process address. Uh, we see that pretty often in malware samples. Then it is uh, storing uh, the uh, address in this variable and uh, a bit later on uh, it is subtracting 10 from this address. And uh, a little bit below we see that uh, this value uh, is uh, pushed as an argument to the next function. Uh, so seems to be that uh, the first argument of this function is this uh, get native system info api call function address minus 10. So when we are looking at the first argument here uh, we see that um, it is executing, executing a couple of mathematical instructions and uh, it seems to be that it is just uh, um, adding 10 to it, so uh, it has restored the original address and uh, it seems to be that it is uh, just calling the uh, get native system info API call here at that uh, point. Unfortunately in uh, real malware uh, this is often much more complicated. Uh, so um, in, real, in uh, real malware uh, we often see um, that uh, these calculations are distributed uh, all over the place and, um, and they are heavily obfuscated so it's often um, very difficult to um, figure out uh, what is actually called at this point. With uh, DDR that is uh, much easier. You can just do a right click and uh, you can get uh, the value of uh, this uh, function pointer. Uh, just uh, pick uh, get value for pointer and source operand and uh, then uh, you see the value which was used at runtime. Uh, so it is confirming what uh, we assumed uh, get native system info is called. With this information uh, we can now go one level up and uh, we can change uh, the name of uh, this argument to function pointer get native system info minus 10. And uh, we have also seen earlier in this function that uh, there was uh, one parameter pushed and this is uh, the second argument of this function. Uh, so um, if we are looking at um, the get native system info, we see that um, this is actually a pointer to the uh, system infrastructure which is uh, storing all the system informations. So uh, again we can go to uh, the uh, function above and um, we can find the second argument here and uh, we can also rename it to something like uh, system info or whatever you like. As far as uh, this is a uh, stack variable uh, which is pointing to a structure, uh, we can also do some housekeeping and uh, quickly assign the right uh, 
structure to it. So uh, that makes it a little bit easier uh, when we are proceeding uh, the analysis um, to see what's going on. Uh, so here we can see that uh, here's actually a comparison between the number of processors and uh, three. With a closer look we see that um, if uh, the number of processors um, of the machine where the sample is running on is smaller than three, then uh, sorry, then um, we are just printing out a likely virtual machine detected. Uh, so if it has uh, two or less processors, um, the sample assumes that it is running on a virtual machine. Uh, if it is more than two processors, uh, it is returning zero. And uh, again, if we go one level up, um, <clears throat> we can see here that um, it is comparing EAX and um, only if it is uh, zero, then uh, it is proceeding with the rest of the malware code. Uh, if not, it is just exiting. Let's rename the function quickly to something like uh, the M check and uh, let's proceed analyzing. So of course, uh, we're also interested in the rest of the code and uh, to make sure that we can uh, execute it on a virtual machine, uh, we can just toggle the uh, eFlex like you have seen before. Uh, in this case, it's a jump zero, so the zero flex are fine. So let's run the trace again and uh, wait for the results. Okay, so um, I've cheated now a little bit and fast forwarded uh, the video. We run into a timeout. Uh, so um, we are seeing this uh, warning message here and uh, it is telling us that uh, the uh, response from the DDR server took too long. By default, uh, the plugin waits uh, for 30 seconds to uh, get the results from the DDR server, uh, the trace for example. And um, if you like, you can change this behavior here uh, under API timeout. Uh, you can increase the timeout, for example, to 60 seconds or to uh, 100 seconds or whatever you think works. And uh, then the plugin waits for a longer time. So um, you've seen earlier that um, you can also configure the uh, number of instructions, for example, uh, which uh, are supposed to be analyzed. And uh, you can play with these little, uh, with these uh, two values a little bit. Um, of course, uh, if you're increasing the um, number of instructions, uh, much more data will be collected, and the files which are going to be exchanged are uh, also much bigger. Um, so uh, sometimes it helps uh, uh, to increase the timeout to uh, do these kind of uh, uh, long traces. But um, nevertheless, um, make sure that you're not. Uh, um, that you are not um, increasing uh, the number of instructions uh, to a too high value. Keep always in mind that um, it is also increasing um, the file size of uh, uh, the data which is collected. So um, <clears throat> coming back here um, to our issue that uh, it timed out, um, we can for example now um, look over to the uh, server side and um, we uh, can check if there was some internal error, for example, there could be a bug inside of DDR which uh, caused a crash, for example, uh, or there uh, could be some other reason, yeah, a super endless loop or whatever, yeah, and um, a sleeper, whatever. And uh, we see here that uh, the analyzers run for 60 seconds, so it seems to be that it was uh, successfully executed. When we are now going back to um, IDA, um, we can proceed with uh, the analysis of the malware to get an idea about what happened. Uh, and um, usually you would now uh, check these uh, instructions, uh, what's happening. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not doing that in detail here in the demo. Uh, and uh, I know the result um, and the reason for um, the timeout in this case is uh, a sleep timer. Yeah. So um, you have a sleep timer here, which is uh, actually waiting for uh, 60 seconds. 
and of course that is more than the 30 seconds uh, and uh, <clears throat> we haven't reached the maximum number of instructions at that point yet so um, the DDR server uh, site is still trying to analyze um, the uh, the sample but there are no new in instructions uh, before this uh, sleep is not uh, uh, it's not over uh, um, so uh, this means that um, uh, the analysis is still gone going on on um, the server side uh, but uh, the plugin uh, runs into the 30 seconds timeout uh, uh, so we could now uh, increase the timeout uh, for example uh, and just wait for a little bit longer or uh, again we can just uh, here uh, knob out these uh, instructions and run it again. Uh, uh, I don't like to wait so I prefer using the knob out functionality. Uh, and uh, now we are uh, running the trace again and uh, now it should be a little bit quicker. So light trace done and uh, now we can uh, clear the old highlighted instructions, uh, clear highlighted instructions, um, and uh, we can highlight it again. And now we can see the new path with uh, all our patches uh, which we have applied. Uh, now you see that uh, we have manipulated uh, the VM check here, uh, even if it has detected the uh, VMware. Nevertheless, uh, we toggled the E flag here, and uh, we are going this way. Uh, and um, now it is uh, checking here um, if its name is uh, evilmelver.exe uh, um, and uh, if that is uh, not the case then uh, the sample is going this way and uh, a quick summary of what's happening here is uh, it is copying uh, itself over to the temp folder and um, then finally here uh, after the sleep uh, it is uh, creating the process and uh, starting starting uh, another instance of itself um, just from this other directory so this is the reason why uh, we are seeing that uh, we are reaching here this uh, exit call and uh, the sample seems to uh, be, uh, or the execution of the sample seems to be uh, stopped at that point. In reality, it has uh, started the new instance, and uh, the new instance um, is running under this name. So um, it will now go this path and um, will proceed uh, to execute the rest of the code. This should be enough for uh, this sample, so let's move on to the next one. Actually, uh, one which we found during a recent APT TAM campaign. It is an um, executable which uh, uh, looks like an XML file, but as you know, if uh, you run that on the command line, it will execute it like any other normal executable. Uh, so. To get an overview about what it is doing, as usual, we are just running a quick light trace with uh, DDR. And um, when we are moving over to DDR, we suddenly see, oops, what that, um, the window disappeared. Uh, so it seems to be that uh, maybe the process was killed or something like that. Interesting. Um, so we are moving back to uh, IDA and uh, <coughs> We suddenly see that um, the uh, light trace was never, nevertheless successfully executed. Uh, so, it seems to be that uh, the DDR process is still running in the background. So, what's going on here? Um, to get an idea, it's always a good idea to um, check the uh, API calls which were executed. And uh, when we are looking at those, we see that uh, there's a couple of initialization going on. Um, and uh, stuff like uh, rebuilding the IRT, for example, uh, a lot of get process address uh, calls, and uh, after that, we suddenly see oh, there is a show window API call. Uh, that looks interesting because with show window you can manipulate the window, and. Uh, 
when we are looking into the uh, disassembly, we see that um, it is uh, using get console window to get the um, handle of its uh, own window, and then uh, it is executing show window. And uh, show window is using uh, ESI for the command show parameter, and ESI is uh, cleared right before. Uh, so uh, we can be pretty sure that ESI is uh, zero in this case. But even if it would be a more complex uh, function in a different sample, for example, of course we can always um, use DDR to get an idea about what this uh, value is. Yeah? Here in our case, uh, zero is obviously. So it is handing over a zero to a show window, and uh, if we are having a closer look to the show window function, we see that uh, the command show parameter um, is uh, offering a couple of different um, options, and uh, if it is zero, uh, it is just hiding the window from the desktop. Uh, so we have solved the uh, the issue uh, why the why the command uh, window suddenly disappeared. Uh, it was not killed; it was just moved into the background. So this is one of the examples uh, how you can pretty quickly uh, analyze what things uh, are, how, or what uh, what's actually happen um, uh, with your sample. And um, now you could either um, leave it like it is in this case uh, because it doesn't hurt, or uh, if you still want to see the uh, window, you just go ahead and uh, you kill these instructions because you don't need them for anything else. Uh, you can just knock them out, knock uh, out marked instructions, and um, then we are restoring the. Uh, then we are restoring the uh, snapshot on the on the other side on the DDR server side, and once it is uh, restored, we can just run the sample again. Uh, we'll just do a light trace again, uh, and uh, now we can see that uh, it is running normally like before, but it is not hiding the window anymore, uh, because we have knocked out these instructions. And we are done, uh, and we can proceed with our analysis. Back to the presentation. Um, another special case which I would like to talk about is if you want to analyze the sample in an air-gapped environment. So, for example, if the uh, sample is doing excessive um, anti-VMware uh, checks, or uh, if you have to disable the networking for any reason, there are probably many cases uh, why you want to analyze the sample on an air-gapped system. You can do that uh, because uh, the uh, engine of DDR is implemented uh, in a way that uh, it is a command line tool, and uh, it is heavily leveraging the D D Dynamo RIO framework uh, to do all the instrumentation. So uh, at the end, the DDR server uh, script is just executing this uh, command line tool to uh, <coughs> to inject um, the uh, DDR DLL into the sample. The DDR DLL is uh, the engine which is uh, doing all uh, the analysis, uh, which is uh, saving all the traces um, and uh, the registers and so on. And um, if you're running this command line tool via DR run uh, uh, C client DLL and uh, the sample to instrument, you uh, will uh, get a JSON file back. Or actually, you're getting two JSON files back, one uh, for the uh, instruction trace and uh, one for the API trace. These uh, JSON files are looking like this. So um, they have all the uh, informations uh, per instruction in them, in it. So um, all the registers, uh, all the values of the registers um, uh, at the point of the instruction, um, the uh, eflex, um, the disassembly, etc., etc., plus uh, the um, memory location, which uh, might be interesting, and so on. 
Uh, and uh, this is a JSON file which is uh, getting transferred over to the uh, IDA site and uh, which is uh, the IDA plugin uh, reading to uh, fill in its uh, data structures. Uh, and uh, with this file um, you can then use um, the uh, plugin like you, like you have seen before. So um, you have seen earlier in the command that um, you have to hand over a configuration file and um, you will find um, in the docs directory of uh, the GitHub repository a uh, sample configuration file which is heavily commented and uh, gives you an idea about what kind of uh, commands you can uh, write into this configuration file. Uh, we will see in the demo um, you can also use um, the output of the uh, DDR server script uh, to get an idea about um, what's going on uh, and uh, what kind of values you can use. Uh, so for example you can just uh, generate a certain command via the plugin and, um, and then uh, you can check the uh, generated configuration. Uh, but again we will see that uh, later on in the demo. So, talking about the demo, let's uh, have a look at it and uh, see how that looks uh, on the command line. So, um, when you are running the uh, command line tool the first time, uh, you can cheat a little bit by looking at the uh, server output. Uh, the DDR server is printing out um, the command which uh, it is actually executing. Uh, and uh, this is um, the command and the configuration which belongs to the command which was uh, automatically generated by the uh, IDA plugin. Uh, so you can start with uh, using uh, the GUI and uh, then you can have a look at um, the configuration file and the command line and uh, this gives you probably a good idea how these uh, things are actually working. Uh, and uh, for the details uh, again you have the, um, the documentation in the docs directory of the GitHub repository. Uh, so um, let's just uh, run this again. And uh, once it is finished we see that uh, it has written all these uh, trace files to the samples directory. Uh, so let's move over to the samples directory and uh, we see that uh, we have all these uh, generated traces here. But uh, there are also further files like uh, the DDR, DDR process trace and um, the DDR process trace is a file which is uh, logging all the processes which were started by the sample. And uh, pretty much the same but for threads are these uh, threads files. Uh, they include uh, the uh, information about which uh, threads the certain uh, processes have uh, started. So if we are looking at um, the um, processes file for example, we see that um, the original sample has uh, executed a second, uh, a second process, uh, the even malware.exe. And um, DDR is um, following all the uh, threads and uh, processes which the original sample is creating. So um, we have seen earlier in uh, IDA the trace uh, which was imported for the main uh, thread and for the main process. Um, <coughs> we haven't seen um, the uh, second process in IDA so far but um, the trace was generated. So uh, we can go back to IDA and uh, we can import um, this one and uh, then we have all the instructions uh, which were executed by uh, the process uh, even malware exe, the second instance of uh, the buffer test.exe file. And um, let me show you how that works. Okay so um, we are back in IDA and um, you uh, hopefully remember the sample which we have uh, looked at earlier, the buffer test dot one, uh, the one uh, which was um, checking if its name was even malware.exe and if that is not the case it is copying uh, itself to the temp folder and executing itself under this name again. 
and uh, you remember that uh, we were only following the main process here yeah? and uh, we were able to highlight the instructions um, down to the point where the uh, initial process exited. But um, of course we are also interested um, in the second part yeah? uh, and um, what happens uh, with uh, the second instance and what uh, kind of code is the second instance executing. One thing we could do of course is um, we could just uh, manipulate the code again like we've done before or uh, now we are importing uh, these, uh, these files which we have just generated. Uh, um, so um, we can clear the highlighted instructions and uh, we are using the load DDR trace button to go to uh, the directory where we have uh, imported these traces which we've seen earlier. Uh, so now I'm interested uh, in the one uh, of uh, evilmalware.exe so I'm loading this one for uh, the traced commands and uh, I'm loading this one for um, the uh, API calls. So API calls. So now we have um, successfully imported um, these uh, traces, one for the API calls and uh, one for the instru instructions. And now we can use uh, DDR uh, like we've done it before and you see that uh, um, uh, that uh, the second instance uh, which is running under evil malware exe is of course going this path and uh, now we can proceed uh, analyzing these uh, these parts and uh, look what it is doing uh, uh, like we've done before. Get source value or whatever helps us to understand uh, what this uh, sample is doing. The last thing which uh, I would like to mention is uh, that uh, you should really keep in mind that um, it is good practice uh, not to run traces for uh, too many instructions. Uh, keep in mind that uh, stopping at every instruction and collecting all the registers and all the memory informations of course it takes a lot of time and um, consumes a lot of memory. So um, it's usually good practice um, to uh, just mark the basic blocks you are interested in. Uh, so for example if we are just interested in the values of uh, these two basic blocks um, it is usually a good idea to uh, just select them at basic blocks to list and uh, this one select at basic block to list uh, and you can see that it was successful here um, and then run the trace just for um, the basic block list. Uh, so, and it is done. Uh, that is much faster, uh, you don't have to wait uh, for too long and uh, you're not creating uh, gigabytes of uh, files. Just keep in mind that um, if um, you are doing that, um, that uh, you now only have these uh, two basic blocks uh, in the database. Uh, so all the others um, are not traced uh, or not in the database in the moment. Uh, which means that uh, if you try to uh, get a value from here, uh, of course you are you're running into a, an error. Yeah? It's not in trace. Uh, it uh, can be a little bit confusing in the beginning if you don't think about it. Uh, but uh, usually you are getting pretty quickly used to that. Uh, and uh, now you can um, analyze the uh, functions which you are actually interested in. Um, get source value or whatever you are looking for. Okie dokie, that's it. So uh, you have seen that uh, DDR is not replacing your brain but uh, nevertheless it speeds up uh, a lot of reversing tasks and uh, it is uh, usually a pretty big help in analyzing malware samples. With this uh, I'm done for today and uh, I'm giving back uh, to the folks from uh, the Blue Team Village. <laughs>